Good evening, West Coast Babies, New Amsterdam, and of course, right here on the Quarantine Coast. Welcome once again to another program of Issues in the News, where we discuss the important events that will have taken place in our country over the last week or so. Um, for the past month or so, I have not been as punctual and as consistent in my presence for the rest of the year. So I want to begin tonight's program by speaking about the most important issue enveloping the minds of Barbicians and that is the sugar industry. We have said a lot about the sugar industry. I have written a lot about the sugar industry. So the issues surrounding this matter ought not to be unfamiliar with any person in Barbies or rather anywhere else, anywhere in Guyana because the issues have been fully ventilated. As you know, the estates are going to be closed and uh, they have been closed, two of them, recently and thousands of sugar workers have been left without a job and they have been left without no alternative source of income to upkeep themselves and family and the stage where they are at now is to receive their pension sorry their severance benefits to which they are entitled in law and even that their legal entitlement of severance has been a struggle for them to achieve Gaisuku, first of all, said that they don't have the money to pay. What Gaisuku did, uh, without announcing to the sugar workers, who are the main stakeholders, along with the government of Guyana, what Gaisuku did was, by an order, which they published apparently in the official gazette, they stripped Gaisuku of all its assets. All Gaisuku's assets have now been transferred over to Nisil. So Gaisuku hardly owns anything anymore. All the assets of Gaisuku have been transferred over to Nisil. What that means, if, if the workers, for example, tomorrow form themselves into an association and decide to sue Gaisuku for their severance pay and benefits and they succeed in court as they should, they will get an empty judgment. They will get a judgment from the court that they will not be able to enforce because Gaisuku has no assets any longer upon which they can levy if the judgment is not paid. So even if the workers are to go to court tomorrow and are to win their case against Gaisuku and are to obtain a judgment against Gaisuku and Gaisuku refuses to honor that judgment, the workers are left with a piece of paper because Gaisuku has divested itself of all its assets. So there is nothing that the workers can levy on to recover any judgments which they may obtain against Gaisuku. And that is the devious manner in which the government is acting in relation to this matter. And this is the level of deception that is playing out. Imagine the workers are owed hundreds of millions of dollars in their self for their severance. And while Gaisuku is delaying and dilating on the payment of this money at the same time and without disclosing this to the public or the workers or the unions, Gaisuku has surreptitiously transferred all its assets out of the company and has put it in the name of another company, thereby insulating those assets from any form of legal attachment if the workers are to go in that direction. So there is no bona fide 
and genuineness with this government in relation to this sugar issue and in relation to sugar workers. So whatever they send Ramjatan and Nagamotu into the estates and into the communities to tell people it is, you cannot accept it as genuine. You cannot accept what they say as the truth because behind the scenes, devious machinations are taking place which are designed to defeat the workers' best interest. So how can the workers trust Prime Minister Nagamutu? How can the workers trust Minister Ramjitan and whoever the government sends to speak to them on this matter? The workers cannot because the behavior of the government is of such that it cannot be trusted. It cannot be trusted. It, every aspect of this matter, as it has unfolded, has exhibited and shown to the world the government not acting in a fair and in an equitable and in a just manner. All the actions of the government have shown a proclivity and a tendency to be devious and to be one that is not above board. And every day you see examples of it. Right now, it has been brought, drawn to my attention that even the manner in which the severance pay is being calculated by Gaisuku, even the way that is now being done for those workers who are getting severance, the manner in which the severance monies are calculated is one that is shrouded in secrecy and one that the government is not making a full and frank disclosure on. What do I mean? Now the laws of this country, the Termination of Employment and Severance Pay Act, essentially outlines a mathematical formula on how one must calculate severance pay when a worker is entitled to severance. You use an average pay of the worker, an average pay, so you have to work out what the average pay of the worker is, and then you multiply that by the, num the period, the number of weeks or the number of years, as the case may be, that the worker has been employed. And that gives you a figure. And that figure is the sum of money to which the worker is entitled. Now, this Gaisuku has been giving workers this a lump sum money, each worker, but is refusing to disclose to the worker the calculation used to arrive at that lump sum figure. They are refusing to tell the worker what is the average income that they are using and they are refusing to tell the worker what length of service they are using to calculate that uh, severance pay. So the workers, when they receive that lump sum, there is no way that the worker can test the veracity the, and the accuracy of the monies that they are receiving. In other words, the worker it cannot verify whether Gaisuku is robbing them or not. And that cannot be, that cannot be the way that the government has to proceed in this matter. I mean, they have closed the estate down. They have left, the, they have abandoned their responsibility to the workers. They have not even paid them severance pay as they should have in a prompt manner and they have designed their own payment method by which they are going to make these payments. And now as they make the payment, you find now they're using this cloak and dagger approach whereby they are not disclosing to the worker the method of calculation that they're using. They are not giving the worker in a frank way the details of the calculation so that the workers can ensure and verify for themselves or through their union whether there is the monies that they are receiving is accurate. 
whether that is actually the money that they are entitled to or whether or not they are being robbed. And I use this opportunity to call upon Gaisuku to be full and frank in their disclosures with the workers and explain to the workers how they are arriving at the monies that they are deeming to be the severance pay of the workers. I, the workers have been calm, they have been very civil, and they have been very lawful in their engagements with Gaisuku. This may not continue, and we do not want an eruption of violence. Because the workers, I have spoken to many of them, they are in a state of hopelessness. As you know, two or three of them have committed suicide. They are desperate, they are angry, and they can do things that are against the law in their frustration. And we are asking Gaisuku to please ensure that the workers get the monies that the law stipulate that they should receive. So that is what I would like to say on the issue of sugar for the time being. As you know, efforts are continuing to help the case of the sugar workers in terms of donations, in, so in terms of arranging hampers and arranging all sorts of uh, facilities and gifts, etc. We have efforts on going in Canada and in the United States and we're going to receive more and more um, stuff, food items, etc. that are going to be distributed to the workers and their family. You are aware, those of you who are listening to me in Barbies, that there are ongoing feeding programs targeting the children of sugar workers, etc. to ensure that they get their meals in time. Those efforts are ongoing and I want to thank all the business men and women and all the citizens of our country and overseas as well for the contribution that they have made both physically and in terms of their donations and other financial inputs that they have contributed to this very, very humanitarian and very um, noble gesture of um, extending a hand of help to the sugar workers of Guyana who have found themselves through no fault of their own in a state of chaos and helplessness. Um, I want to move to another issue. You would have seen, and I never spoke about it in this program, but you would have seen me writing and speaking in the press about uh, the establishment of a local law school in Guyana. Of course, in certain sections of the media, the Attorney General has been wreaking havoc with this issue. He has accused me of all sorts of things. Now let me make it clear that the People's Progressive Party and I are not opposed to the establishment of a local law school in Guyana. We are not opposed to the establishment of a local law school in Guyana. Whether we have the need for a local law school is a matter for the determination of a feasibility study. I don't have the data here, I don't have the statistics here, and I will not be premature in pronouncing whether we need or we don't need a law school in Guyana. What I would say that I am not opposed to a law school being established in Guyana. However, legal education in the region is governed by a treaty and it is governed by a common legislation that is in the law books of all the CARICOM states. It is called the Council of Legal Education Act. Under that law, a body called the Council of Legal Education of the West Indies is empowered by all the countries of CARICOM to run and administer legal education in the region. This council 
determines where law is going to be teached, taught, sorry, where law is going to be taught and at which university and then upon the completion of the course of study at the university, which law schools, students from which country will go and in what number. All of that, those arrangements are governed by and administered by an organization called the Council of Legal Education, of which every country is a part. Guyana is a part of that organization. And if one requires in any of the countries, any of the member states of CARICOM, all of whom are signatory to that treaty, if they wish to open a law school in their respective territory, they cannot do so or they should not do so unless they obtain the permission of the Council of Legal Education because the Council of Legal Education run it and manage those law schools. Currently, we have a law school in Trinidad, we have one in Jamaica, and we have one in Bahamas. This Attorney General, I don't think he knew that he needs the permission of the Council of Legal Education, and he went with full speed and signed some memorandum of understanding with two organizations and academic institutions that no one ever heard of before to establish a law school here. When I drew to the attention of the public that the Attorney General cannot by himself decide that he will establish a law school in Guyana, or Guyana by itself for that matter, cannot make that decision unilaterally, that they must do so with the permission and authority of the Council of Legal Education. When I said so, the Attorney General said he has the permission. Well, one year after that, he has been unable to produce that permission. And in the meanwhile, the Council of Legal Education has said that he has no such permission, that the Council never gave Guyana permission to establish a law school, at least not recently. This Attorney General said he got the permission from the law school. But when he can't produce the permission, obviously he lied. He has been changing course since. And over the last six or seven months, he has been engaged in this one-man relentless battle, trying to establish that he has some permission to build a law school in Guyana. Where when the council that's supposed to give him the permission, a big international agency said, no, we have not given you any permission. Anyhow, the matter was supposed to be finally discussed at the council meeting held last week. The Attorney General went to the meeting and up to now, several days after, almost a week after, not a single word of utterance from the Attorney General. Why is he so silent? Why is he so silent? Why is he not telling the country what was determined and what was discussed at the meeting of the council that was held last week? Well, let me tell you why. Because at the meeting, he was given a sound trashing for his irresponsible statements and the lies which he peddled in the Guyana media that the council granted him permission. And the council reiterated that they never granted him permission and that Guyana does not have permission to open a law school in Guyana. And the council is in the process of preparing a statement which they will make public and that should shut the Attorney General up, finally. But the point is the lies and the lies that is barefacedly told to this country and when you try to correct him. He continues to peddle the lie. Shamelessly continues to peddle one lie after another in his attempt to defend the impossible. And that is what we have been seeing over the last seven or eight months on this issue. The other important matter that I would like to talk about is the establishment of a commission of inquiry which was established recently. Now you would recall that during the last week of 
January last month, Minister Harmon was reported in the press as hinting to the possibility of the president establishing a COI to investigate killings which took place between 2002 to 2009. That is what Mr. Harmon said, that there will be a commission of inquiry, there will be a commission of inquiry to investigate the killings which occurred in Guyana from 2002 to 2009. Within 48 hours, the government propagandists started their spinning. And this commission of inquiry now into the, the killings which took place between 2002 to 2009 became killings that took place under the PPP government and killings that took place during Jack Dale's presidency and killings that implicate the PPP and that the PPP was part of some uh, phantom squad of that period. All this information started to be generated quickly by the government media and their propagandists on the social media. Within a few days thereafter, within a few days thereafter, when Mr. Harmon spoke, I don't even think Mr. Harmon was serious. I don't think that he, at the time, thought that a commission of inquiry will be established merely days after. At least he did not convey that impression. But just a few days, less than a week after Mr. Harmon made that disclosure, a one-man commission of inquiry was established because the nation was then bombarded or confronted with Mr. Justice Donald Trotman being sworn in to head a one-man commission of inquiry into one incident, Lindo Creek, which occurred in 2008. So I want you to pause to examine the difference, the material difference, which occurred between what Mr. Minister Harmon disclosed and what actually was set up. Harmon said that the president will set up or is likely to set up a presidential inquiry into the killings that took place between 2002 to 2009. So we are speaking about one inquiry and we are speaking about 2002 to 2009 killings. Now, any reasonable, rational person would understand and who have any familiarity with the establishment of a commission of inquiry would know that that is a huge undertaking. And therefore, you need a complementary of staff, you need to establish the place where the commission is going to be held, you need to work on very, very carefully work out the terms of reference because it is the terms of reference that would confer the commission of inquiry with the authority. It is the term of reference that will provide the mandate of the commission. We'll say what the commission has to do, what the commission is intended to do, and the parameters within which the commission of inquiry must operate. Those are what are called the terms of reference. Now these are technical documents to prepare. And then that's, uh, so that's technical preparation for the commission. Then you come to the other two important aspects. Would you consult? Now this is a government that speaks about healing. This is a government that speaks about social cohesion. But every single policy of this government, and I can give you one policy at a time, every single policy of this government is designed and is intended to create rift and discord and to create dissent in our society. Not to cohese, not to bring together, not to unite, but to disunite and to rip apart and to cause tension. A prudent government preaching a policy of cohesion 
would have invited civil society to come to the table and consult with them, ask for their input. A prudent government would have asked the opposition, come to the table and give us your input. Help us draft the terms of reference. And secondly, a prudent government interested in knowing the truth, interested in knowing the truth and being genuine about finding out what actually transpired, would ensure that the commission has integrity, that the inquiry will be done in a credible manner. And how best to ensure that? Appoint to that commission of inquiry people of credible international stature, people who will be regarded by the Guyanese population and the world to be independent. People who are qualified, who are independent, and who have standing and respect in the international community. That is why when we did the Walter Rodney COI and we did the Linden COI, the Linden COI of June the 12th, it had five commissioners, five. Two from Guyana, two from Jamaica, one from Trinidad. We sat with the opposition and we worked out the terms of reference. Sentence by sentence, we worked and approved the terms of reference. And then in terms of the commissioner, those who constituted the commission, we sat with the opposition and we discussed the names. In fact, the commissioner who came from Trinidad, Dana Sitahal, was a nominee from the opposition. The Walter Rodney Commission of Inquiry, though the PNC did not agree with it, we still consulted with them. And the commissioners that we appointed were all outside of Guyana. They were from Jamaica, Trinidad, and Barbados, no Guyanese. And if this government is serious, that would be its approach on this commission of inquiry. But we have moved from Mr. Harmon speaking about the commission of inquiry into debts starting from 2002 to 2009 to a one-man commission of inquiry only dealing with a, one incident, the Lindo Creek Massacre, as it is described in the press. And that incident occurred in 2008. So how come you jump from 202, 203, 204, 205, 206, 207, 208, you have the Bartica Massacre, Lusignan Massacre, the jailbreak, you have hundreds of people being killed in the meanwhile, you have the Agricola Massacre, you skip all of that and you come to Lindo Creek Massacre, what is it? And you appoint one man? And I have no reason to doubt Mr. Trotman's credibility, but Mr. Trotman is Raphael Trotman's father. Raphael Trotman is the leader of the AFC. He is a minister of this government. He is a member of parliament of this government. The AFC is one, the major coalition partner with the PNC in this government. How can the population seriously regard Mr. Mr. Donald Trotman as impartial and independent? How can the PPP regard it? How can any objective Guyanese regard Mr. Trotman as independent and impartial? One commissioner, whatever decision he makes, that is it. There is no one to counterbalance him. There is no one to, to contradict him. There is no one to disagree with him. He is the one man Rambo that will hear the, the petition, the commission. And he is the father of one of the leaders of the government? What kind of kangaroo business is this? And you expect Guyanese people to take this commission seriously? You out of 10 years, you yourself identified it, 2002 to 2009, 
And then all of a sudden you take one incident that happened in 2008. And we have to ask why the president is choosing that one incident. What does the president know about that one incident that makes him choose that one incident? These are questions that have to be answered. And unless they are sensibly answered, this commission is dead from even before it starts. It is dead in terms of credibility if those questions that I'm raising are not answered. They're not bizarre questions. They are germane questions. They are intelligent questions. They are questions that any probing mind will ask. Are we not going to get this big commission anymore? Is Mr. Trotman going to be the only uh, commissioner? So that he will start with this one and then what? We will go backward? We will start from 2008 and then go to 2007 and then 2006? So we will start with the Luziknan massacre, then the Bartika massacre, I don't know in what order they appeared. I mean, the, the thing doesn't make sense. One would have expected According to them, it was a crime spree and it had some kind of, 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 of science and consistency behind it. Isn't that why they are saying that there is some conspiracy? Well, the conspiracy can't start at the end. It has to start at the beginning. And it began, let us assume, I don't think that it began with the jailbreak. The violence started before that. But let us assume that it began with the jailbreak. Isn't that a logical place to start and to see who and who used to, how the bandits operated? Our information is that the bandits went into in the Congress place when they broke out of Camp Street. Our information is the first set of ammunition and arms that the bandits had was from, camp, was from Congress place. Our information is that many PNC leaders used to go into the back of Buxton and meet with those bandits. You think that with a commission of this type, those information will ever come to light? No, they will not come to light. And that is why I am saying that this commission is another political hatchet job. It is another political witch hunting exercise. And I make those deductions based only on what the government has done. Just what they have done to their own commission of inquiry. They have bastardized it, they have contaminated it with bias, and they have made it basically an institution or an entity that no one can have any trust in. No one can regard with any degree of seriousness. Lindo Creek, the official position of the police force on Lindo Creek, which was made public, is that all the persons are dead who were there, and there was one eyewitness, some young child, and no one knows where that child is. So I don't know what, what, what we investigated. That is the evidence out there. That is what um, the police records reflect. That was published in the news quite recently. So what is it that the president knows about Lindo Creek that no one else knows? Why? What? And why choose someone so close to your government to be the commission, to be the, the, the commissioner? Why are you afraid, Mr. President, to open this inquiry and put international people there? Why? What, what are you afraid of? So, Nothing much will come out of this commission. This commission, in my view, as I said in a recent interview with the newspapers, this commission of inquiry is intended to try to implicate the PPP in some kind of criminality during that period. Imagine most of the people who perished during that period were PPP supporters. PPP support villages were ransacked and brutalized. And now the PPP is being accused of being responsible for the criminality. 
I am uh, living in an upside down world, I tell you. Whenever the police force used to go out there and do their jobs with the black clothes, people like Fraser and Mirai and, and, and a whole host of soldiers, um, policemen, who used to go out there and get the job done and deal with criminals, whenever they do that, the PNC used to protest. The PNC used to protest. They used to call for the dismantlement, the dismantling of the Commission of Inquiry, of the, of the, the, the Black Clothes. And when the Black Clothes are not there, the regular police force can't deal with the crime. And whenever the Black Clothes is on the road, the PNC comes out and they protest police brutality, extrajudicial killing. And when the black clothes go back in the barracks, the killing spree starts. And you can draw your own inference from what I'm saying. When Blackie London, the infamous criminal, Blackie, when he was killed by the police, after shooting out with the police, after shooting at the police for nearly six hours on the east bank of the Marara, when Blackie London was killed, the PNC took over his funeral. They took him to the square of the revolution. They rolled his coffin along the streets of Georgetown. They held marches at the funeral. Mr. Desmond Hyde was the guest of honor at the funeral. They took the Guyana flag and they put it over his coffin. And this was a criminal that brutalized people right across the length and breadth of Guyana. He raped, he murdered, he beat, he robbed, he burned people houses. And when he was eventually shot by the police, this PNC took him and made him a hero and gave him a big funeral at the square of the revolution. And they took the Guyana flag and they wrapped it around his coffin. And now they are accusing the PPP of criminality. As I said, we are living in an upside down world. But you know, nobody will believe these things that they are spreading. So they can go ahead with the commission of inquiry. Our concern is that you cannot pay sugar workers their severance, but you are going to pour hundreds or, or dozens of millions of dollars in a bottomless pit to hold a commission of inquiry that will yield nothing. They have had, I said, that this government will go down in the Guinness Book of World Records as holding the most commission of inquiry more than any other government at any period in world history. The APNU government, the Granger-led administration from 2015 to when however they lasted long, they lasted office, will go down in the Guinness Book of World Records as holding the most commission of inquiry ever. And I am sure no one can contradict me. This is a commission of inquiry government. If a plane is found, there is a commission of inquiry. A boat is sink, there is a commission of inquiry. Somebody gets shot somewhere, there's a commission of inquiry. The police force not doing the job, there's a commission of inquiry. Flooding somewhere, there's a commission of inquiry. It is a government of commission of inquiry. Why the public service for servants not performing? You have a commission of inquiry. Something people not getting enough land, you have a commission of inquiry. Every single thing is a commission of inquiry. Each of these commission of inquiries cost millions of dollars. This is also, as I, I've, written seven, I've written several articles about this thing. It's an opportunity to give cronies jobs. It is a way to, to employ people. It is, it is a way where the government is incompetent and incapable of dealing with any given matter. They just hand it to a commission of inquiry. Well, give the commission of inquiry your salary. Most of what the Commission of Inquiries have been asked to do are governmental functions. The government not doing nothing. They're flying around the world in 
doing what they should not be doing, and then paying commission of inquiries, paying people to hold commission of inquiries to do their job. Each of the commission of inquiries, each of them, the cheapest one, is a few million dollars. The more expensive one can run into dozens of millions because these things, they come expensively. Commission of inquiry is not a cheap thing, but this government loves it. They love these things, commission of inquiry. So we have just, we just finished one month in the year and we already have a commission of inquiry that will soon start up. So I will stop here and go to the callers. Callers, please ensure that you speak loudly because uh, viewers have been complaining both on Facebook and I'm sorry I didn't acknowledge my Facebook fans who are looking. Um, the people on Facebook as well as persons who are listening to this program or are viewing this program complain to me that they do not hear what the callers say. So callers, please ensure that you speak up. You're on the air caller. Hello, good night, Sam. Good night. is making a point that all of us know the government has no young people the government is a collection of old people every one of them every one of them I believe over 50 years old definitely most of them in their 60s and 70s most of them and all the people that they are employed the chairman of the GCOM is 84 years old, Mr. Donald Trotman is 80 something. Every person that they appoint is of the same age group. They are uncomfortable with young people. And the president said to young people, when they ask him for jobs, he said, go and sell sugar cake and cook up. Planting chip. That's his vision for young people. Or go to the new opportunity core or join the army. That is his vision. That is his vision for young people. Go to the army. Call you on the air. Yes? I'm fine. All right, thank you. Yes. Yes. Well, you, you, you can't discuss people's uh, personal business here. This is not a type of program for that, all right? You have a problem in Ramaya, take a lawyer and, and, and um, sort it out in court if, if he has done you something legally wrong. All right, caller? This is a serious program where we speak about important issues that affect the lives of hundreds and thousands of people. And let us keep the discussions to that quality and level. Caller, you're on the air. You're calling from Black Bush? Yes. What part of Black Bush? Uh, my Curie. My Curie, yes. You see, what I would like to tell you, everything that happens in this country happens in here. We need to see people in a car to sit by ourselves. You know? And you don't want to get far. You don't want to get far. I hear you. That's the only problem. It's people that get far from cars, the problem. Yeah. All right, caller. Okay. Thank you. The caller says that the people are responsible for the government that they get, and that is a a statement of some accuracy. Caller, you are on the air. Good day. Thank you. I 
They put what? What was it? What? What? Did, where did they put? Did they not put what? Oh, the bus. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Carl. The caller is making the point that the bus, the David Granger bus, I think that's what it's called, is not operating in a fair manner. It is only operating within certain communities. There is no bus in Kanji. There is no bus at Crabwood Creek, at Skeldon, or any of those areas. And I have reports already from the west coast of Barbies where the bus only stops at selective villages. The bus only stops to pick up children at particular villages. It skips villages. Although the bus is empty and there are children on the road, it skips certain villages. So the bus is being operated in a discriminatory manner. I say to you, every policy of this government is discriminatory. Every action of this government is discriminatory. And you check it one by one for yourself and you will see what I'm speaking about. Their employment policy is discriminatory. Their dismissal policy is discriminatory. And I can go on. Call her your dear. Good night. You know, something that is happening in this country right now, you know, all you're having is, is criticism of the government. Now, when are you going to start working this again? You know, it, it's too disgusting. All we have is people who confuse you and it's not because of that government and it's not because of the Indian government. You know, when are you going to live like I need? <laughs> but why are people criticizing me? No, but let, let's take it one step at a time. Uh, don't you think that the government is doing things that would attract criticisms? Yeah, but when you were in office, people criticize you. People will always criticize you, and every government will try to minimize the amount of criticism. But this government, that this government is doing everything it can to increase the amount of criticism. We're not getting anywhere. You know, I just think it's just in this country. That is true. That is true. And I'm happy that you recognize that. How can the government pay like Bill for one community and not have 7,000 people in another community? Is it that true? Yes. You don't know that. I don't know that. Okay, that, that's wrong. Well, that's the point I'm making to you. Anyhow, caller, you got to read up the facts and get acquainted with the issues, and then you will understand why people are criticizing the government. All right, thank you for calling. So that caller is unaware of, of, of why people are criticizing the government. I don't travel from Georgetown to come here to criticize the government because I like to criticize the government. I don't come here to criticize the government. I come here to discuss issues, and in discussion of these issues, invariably they lead to a critical remark or critical examination of the government's conduct and the government's policy. Caller, you're in the air. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead, sir. Yes, could you lower your television television volume? Thank you, sir. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry from that point. Yes. Um, I don't regard that. And that is going on since 1992? Um, I don't understand that. I don't understand. What part of Blackbush you're from? Um, let's go, let's go. So how do the other people in Lesby hold and have, have, have water? Uh, yeah, but uh, everybody was, was, was saying 
that the Gerard is coming and the, the, the evolution point is, is slowed down and X, Y, and Z. Look, Carla, there's got to be a more fundamental reason why you are not getting water. Could you make contact with the Water Users Association, make contact with the NDC in the area, make contact with the regional chairman, he visits Blackbush, I think once weekly, and other regional officials. All right, Carla? Yes. That, yes. It's impossible that this Carla would not be getting water since, since 1992. Impossible. So the phones are going, and um, I, I'm looking at my phone here also, and I see that uh, the Facebook following is increasing every day, every program that we are here. Carla, you're on the air. Hello, good night. Thank you very much, Carla. A lot of people don't understand that the municipalities are not part of the government of the day. The Georgetown City Council and the New Amsterdam City Council are not part of the government. So regularly when we were in government, we were held responsible for the state of Georgetown. Though the state of Georgetown is the responsibility of the mayor and city council of Georgetown. And the mayor and city council of Georgetown for the 24 years that we were in government was controlled by PNC and by GGG, Hamilton Green. And yet I see Freddie Kisun and people who should know better because they, at least they went to school. And Freddie Kisun is holding me, I saw him write an article, somebody showed it to me, holding me responsible for some street block in Georgetown. You would expect that this man, Freddie Kisun, is a teacher and that he would recognize a distinction between the, the town council and the government. Town council is responsible for the towns, for the town, the area in which the locality falls. So, madam, the point I'm trying to make is that those who are con in control of the mayor and city council of New Amsterdam, are responsible for the state of that area that you are complaining about. And we need, we need to keep making this, this distinction. Call your dear. I'm sorry, I'm not hearing you clearly. We are fastly approaching program time. Call your dear. Hi, Good night, sir. Good night. I'm calling you to, um, I listen to a call at the store, um, I can't manage to listen to the nonsense. There's someone was saying on your program that you're criticizing, you're highlighting the deficiency of an incompetent government. And if we stop doing this, then the people scholar for making those points. Everyone has an entitlement to express a view of their choice. I have a right and a freedom to express a view praising the government if I wish or criticizing the government if I wish. And that is a right that the law gives us, the constitution gives us, and it's a right that we struggled for for a very, very long time. 
the younger generations do not know that there was a time in this country where we didn't have television, of course, but you couldn't even say what I'm saying at a street corner. You were afraid to even say what I'm saying now on this TV in your own home. That was the state of this country. And we struggled and we removed those oppressive mechanisms. Yes, caller, you're on the air. Yes, Mr. Good night. Good night. I'm coming to make a complaint yeah. Tabrook Market. Tabrook Market? Yes. Yes. Uh huh. Yes. The landing fee you have to pay is one two thousand dollars for one tub. One tub what? Hassa. Hassa. Yes. How much it would take? Sorry, how much? Two thousand dollars for one tub landing fee. That is the fee in the market. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure, but I can find out. Yeah. I can find out. Well, you get a lot of hassle? Yes, sir. I'll just, I'll just buy it myself in my Okay. Um, must call me after this program. I'll take your number. All right, sir. Yeah. All right? Thank you. Call immediately after the program. Yeah. See how I get my supply of hassle here. So, I'll take two more calls and... Uh, Caller, you're on the air. Good night, sir. Good night. You can find the link of my Yeah, I'm telling you, you check the Guinness Book of World Record. Uh, if you don't want to do anything, that is the reason why you said you want to do it. These people can't run the country. These people can't individually run their own homes. Exactly. How can they collectively run a country? And they're suffering the people because of that. Every day, every day, the economic climate in this country is declining. Every day it is becoming more and more difficult for people to survive in this country. It is a country without law. The rule of law no longer exists in this country. No, but we have to ensure that we restore it to where it should be. And, 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 and that is the struggle of all of us. I wish you all the best. No, you can't wish me. you got to come and join me. I'm telling you here. Well, thank you. Okay. Thank you. We'll take one final call and that will bring us to the end of the program. Caller, you're on the air. Caller, you're on the air. We missed that caller. So, uh, let me see if another caller is coming through. Anyway, then one caller. Caller, you're on the air. Good night. Good night. Yes. Yes. Well, that is what I'm saying. Even without even criticizing the gentleman, Mr. Donald Shotman, he, you see, justice must not only be done, but it must appear to be done. The appearance is as great as the actuality. You can't put somebody whose son is in the government and you are working for the government attempting to do something that yeah. is supposed to be done yeah. impartially. But Mr. Yeah. Mr. Donald Trotman should not have accepted the appointment, recognizing that his son is in the government. But I suppose we judge ourselves by different standards. Well, I know, I know that it will be a colossal cost to the taxpayers because COIs do not come cheaply. They are an expensive, expensive engagement. All right? Well, I don't know. They started out saying that we will have a big, massive inquiry and now it has been reduced to one incident and one man investigating. All right, Carla, so thank you for making uh, those important contributions. This is where I have to say that we have come to the end of the program. I will join you next week. And until we meet again, please be safe and have a great evening.